Dr. Nolan, would you like to introduce? Sure. Can you all hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I have the pleasure today to introduce Jenny Dudak, um, who is a master's student in our program. Jenny hails from Manchester, Iowa, in the northeastern part of the state, which is uh, in the Driftless region, uh, which I learned about when I lived in the Midwest and thought was kind of cool because everything I worked in was a, a glacial soil, but then we found out that not everything up there is glacial, so um, kind, of a, kind of a cool area. Um, she's not far from the town where the Field of Dreams movie was, was shot, which is, if you haven't seen, it's a film about um, Midwestern agronomy. Um, and, and they play baseball in it, but it's mostly about corn. And um, anyhow, she, she went out to the East Coast for a while um, after graduating from, from uh, high school and, um, and then ended up in Texas um, working in the pharmaceutical industry and then in College Station and has done her bachelor's in agronomy in our department and is now wrapping up her master's um, working on uh, management options for reniform nematode and cotton. So I'm going to turn it over to Jenny. Okay. Thanks for that introduction. Let me get my screen here. All right. Can everybody see that? Okay. It's perfect. Okay, sounds good. So like Dr. Nolan said, my name is Jenny Dudak, and I am going to be talking to y'all today about some research I did involving cotton genetics and nematocytes and their impact on yield in uh, reniform nematode infested fields. So before we get down to the nitty gritty, I want to give you a little background information about reniform nematodes. So the scientific name is actually Rhodolinculus reniformis. Um, and it actually, their name comes from the shape that the infected females take on uh, once they start producing eggs. It's actually um, sort of a kidney shape. I've got some pictures later I'll show you. Uh, there are subtropical species that actually had thought to be originated from Hawaii. And soil texture for this specific um, species of nematode is actually not as limiting of a factor as other species. I included this point in here because um, as a general statement, most folks say that nematodes prefer sandy soils, uh, but reniform nematodes can actually thrive in the uh, finer texture soils or like the heavier um, clays or things like that. And so I actually was just reading a um, paper that's, that theoret or theorized to your whatever that word is, <laughs> that thought that um, the, um, the reason that reniform nematodes can thrive in, the, in that environment is because they outcompete the other nematodes in the soil. Uh, they actually have a host range that includes both monocots and dicots, uh, but the plants are mainly grown in more of the, um, oh, this, this is supposed to say subtropical to tropical areas. I'm sorry, this is a mistake. Um, and then most of the, or some of the examples include bananas and pineapples and of course cotton. Um, symptomology, if you're looking at um, cotton, you'll see stunted plants, leaves that are chlorotic or green and um, wilted. And so um, when that is actually, it's unfortunate because that is actually um, also symptomology for a nutrient deficiency or other nematodes. And so it's kind of hard to determine uh, one way that you can in the field is kind of like a quick and dirty way to look at it is you dig up a plant, look at the roots, and then for reniform nematodes, they say that the roots are supposed to be, um, they call them dirty. And it's because if you shake the roots off, the soil uh, will still stick to the gelatinous mass of the eggs. And so it looks dirty. Uh, but the best way to actually determine um, if you do have a reniform nematode um, problem is to take a soil sample and send it to a lab. So actually diving into a little bit of the life cycle of the reniform nematode. So it actually starts, and this is, it differs from um, what is kind of generalized from nematodes for most of them. Um, it'll start at the J1 stage or juvenile one, and then move to the J2 stage. And the J2 stage is actually where it hatches. 
Um, but it differs from other species because it's actually not parasitic at the J2 stage, it's still vermiform. And as it progresses, um, it'll move through the J3 stage, the J4 stage. These two stages are, from what I've read, it's more of just developmental. And then finally, it'll molt to the adult stage. And um, the females are actually the ones that are the plant parasitic nematodes. The males um, just live in the soil and they're, they're there for reproduction, basically. Um, I have three pictures here that kind of um, show different stages. Um, and the first one I wanted to talk about, the reason I put it on here is because it, it does a really good job at showing the stylet of the nematode. Can y'all see my cursor or do I need to get a pointer? We can see it. Okay, thanks. And so you can, right here, this little straw-like or needle-like structure is called a stylet. And that's actually um, um, pretty significant, or I mean, it's, it's, if you have a plant parasitic nematode, it's going to have, for the most part, it's going to have a stylet. Um, this middle picture here actually shows a female um, reniform nematode. These, actually both of these pictures I got through a stereoscope the help of a colleague, her name's Morgan. Um, we found these plants actually out in San Angelo. And this, the thing that's circled right here is actually the female and she is uh, described as sedentary, semi-endoparasitic. And that means when she infects the root or puts, sticks her stylet or protrudes through the root, um, she will stay in the same place um, the sedentary, and then she will um, put her like head uh, part of her body into the root. And so the back part of her body is still sticking out. And as you can see, she's starting to fill up with eggs. And so she's kind of taking on that kidney shape. That's um, pretty specific for reniform nematodes. And then the last picture here, um, this was kind of cool. It was a egg mass that we actually um, broke. And you can see these little pill forms. There's pill structures here. That's actually reniform eggs. And there's little, there's nematodes inside those little baby nematodes. Um, oh, hang on just a second. This is not the right slideshow. I have a different one. I'm so sorry. It's this one. I have an updated one. Okay, we'll try this again. All right, so adding these pictures to the um, to the slideshow, the reason I wanted to put these pictures in here is because this one, it's actually, this one's actually taken by Dr. Noland um, in a field in Tom Green County, which is out by San Angelo. Um, you can, the reason we, I wanted to put this in here is because it shows how nematodes move through the soil. So they actually don't travel very far on their own uh, they do need another source, and most of the time that's mechanical source, like an implement or something like that going through the field. And you can see that it's pretty streaky, and that's actually a, a common symptom or something to look for if you're looking at a nematode infestation. The second picture is also very important. It was also taken by Dr. Noland in a field in Tom Green County. It actually shows um, more of a hot spot of... Um, um, infestation. And so this, they call them hot spots, and it's just where the nematodes are, are gathered and, and are worse, really. Um, and then eventually, once implements go through, it'll streak it, and you know, and then you'll get that um, the streaking part. So those last two pictures kind of showed pretty well um, how bad reniform nematodes can, um, I mean, be on cotton. And so actually, 2019, the nemet reniform nematodes themselves accounted for about 189,000 bill loss across the cotton belt, which is actually just under 1% of total cotton production in the U.S. Uh, there's currently zero commercially or commercially available cotton varieties with specific reniform resistance. Now, there are a few companies that have um, experimental lines, but they're not commercially available yet for growers. And then lastly, um, the efficacy or persistence of um, nematicides is actually influenced a lot by environmental factors. And it, that could differ depending on the part of the state you're in or the part of the country or whatnot. So um, an environmental factor, a good example would be something like rain. And when I started this research, um, I, had, I had in mind that genetic resistance and nematicides would influence cotton performance 
in their presence in reniform um, infested or on in reniform infested fields. I actually, so my research consists of two studies. I have a genetic study and a nematicide study. And so each of these studies um, were conducted at three different locations. So first location is I'm going to talk about is Damon, which is like Fort Bend County, um, upper Gulf Coast area. Second one is the bottom farm here in College Station. And then the third is Wall, Tom Green County over by San Angelo. So a little bit about my experimental design. The, the, they were similar in they were both randomized complete block designs with four reps. Of the genetic study for my main effect, I had six to eight varieties, and that was year and location dependent. Um, there's a split plot application of fluopyram and protheoconazole, which was which is Propulse. The trade name is Propulse. Um, and then when I analyzed this using SAS, um, my fixed effects were location, variety, nematicides, and all possible interactions. And then my random effect was block nested within location. And then the nematicide study, it was a two by six factorial. Um, and that two part of the factorial is the varieties that I used. Um, one of the varieties was phytogen 480. Um, and I do wanna make a point that that one is not actually reniform resistant, it's root knot resistant. Um, but we put it in because it had been recommended um, to growers that it might help in their reniform problem fields. And then the second one was a susceptible check. And so that was either 440 or 340. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit later, why it changed. And then the six factorial has to do with the nematicides and I'll um, show you that later too. And then in SAS, the fixed effects, I had location, it was the same location, variety, nematicide and all possible interactions. And then the random was the same block nested within location. Uh, and then my plots were 40 feet long and four rows wide and data was actually collected from the middle two rows. So the data that actually was collected, we did nematode samples twice uh, a growing season. So the first uh, was prior to planting or pre-plant. And then the second timing was at harvest or just after harvest. Um, and I used the pie pan method of extraction and to get the nematodes out of the soil. And just a little, uh, Fun fact, I've counted about 155,000 nematodes to date. I'm not done counting them yet. Um, so that number will go up and I'm sure those are rookie numbers for the nematologists out there, but I thought it was kind of neat. Um, plant height was also collected twice during the growing season at 80 and 100 days after planting. Um, some other fact or some other things we were looking at were stand count, um, total nodes, nodes above white flower, things like that. Um, and then all of the seed cotton samples were ginned in College Station at, on a tabletop gin, and the lint was set up to, sent up to Lubbock for grading. Today, I'm actually only going to talk to you about yield um, from last year and this year, and then partial net return from last year. The reason that I'm not going to present partial net return um, for this year is because I don't have all my grades back. Uh, and I also put in the planting dates and I, I thought that was very important and I wanted to point out if you look in the 2019 uh, box, um, you can see wall, it was planted on June the 27th. Now that's actually pretty late for that area. Um, we had some hangups and so I wanted to make that a point up front um, because that could have affected yields. Um, and then 2020 everything was planted, uh, you know, within a reasonable time frame. So looking at the varieties that were planted in the genetic study, like I had hinted at before, um, the, so the Damon location, which is Fort Bend County, the susceptible check that we planted was 440. And then we found out later that it actually is not a susceptible, true susceptible variety. It actually has one gene root knot resistance. Um, and so we changed that to phytogen 340 at College Station and Wall and then carried that on throughout the rest of the study. Um, so the 2019 Damon, all, the yields, they will be presented separately because I couldn't combine. Um, and so going through some of these different varieties that like I said, phytogen 440 is root knot resistant, 480 is root knot resistant. The, this variety or this line right here is actually a phytogen experimental line and that one is reniform um, resistant. And then we have Dinah Grow 3651, which is root knot, Delta Pine 1747, which is root knot. And then the last one 
is a Delta Pine NPE. Um, that one is root knot resistant, but they did not follow through with that one um, this year. So it's not commercially available. Um, and then, like I, like I said before, each of these were um, planted with a split plot application of fluopyram or protheoconazole, which is propulse at 13.6 ounces per acre in furrow. And then at 2020, in 2020, we, all of the locations had the same varieties. We got lucky there, but I did add in two varieties and I want to point them out. So this, this one right here with the star, uh, that is another phytogen, resist, phytogen experimental line that is resistant to reniform nematodes. And then this very bottom one is a delta pine experimental line that is res resistant to reniform nematodes. And again, it, there was a split plot application of a uh, propulse applied at planting. So like promised, the Damon uh, 2019 yield will, or I'm presenting that separately. If you take a look at the Y axis here, I've got lint yields in pounds per acre. I do wanna make a note, all of my lint yields are going to be presented in pounds per acre, just for reference. And then you, I have all of the different varieties across the bottom here. Um, I do want to point out that this phytogen experimental, which was the PD3 or PX3D32, um, it yielded among the best, but not better than the susceptible check or what we thought was a susceptible check that year. Uh, but also the application of propulse and the interaction with the varieties it did not influence yield at, at that location last year. So I was able to combine College Station and Wall together. And I put these p-values up here because there was a location by, the, by variety interaction. And um, for that reason, I'm going to present my main effects uh, and then I will do each location separately after. So the main effects, again, um, the y-axis is uh, lint yield pounds per acre. So looking at these two locations combined, you can see that the phytogen um, experimental line yielded the best or it did do better than this phytogen 340, which was the susceptible check. Now moving on to looking at them separately, kind of pulling them apart, this um, phytogen resistant variety it, in College Station, um, it did yield among the best, but, and it did, it did yield better than the phytogen 340, which was a susceptible check. And then at wall, the same um, resistant line yielded among the top and it did yield above that phytogen 340. But I do want to point out that that Delta Pine um, NPE variety, it was hanging around there at the top too. So moving on to 2020, um, I was able to combine all of my locations together and so I wanted to point out that there was a location by chemistry effect, uh, there was a chemistry effect, and there was a location by variety effect, and I'll touch on all of those a little in the next slide. So the main effects here, we've got, um, if you look at these first three varieties, these are all three of the reniform resistant varieties. Um, in, the phytogen varieties yielded better than the delta pine, but they all did better than that susceptible check, which is um, good. <laughs> um, and then cotton yields were actually higher at wall than in Damon and College Station. And actually the application of propulse reduced yield by 6.4% compared to the untreated check. Now we think that that might have something to do with the phytotoxicity component of propulse. Um, we, I did look into stand counts to see if that was something that mattered, um, but it wasn't necessarily, but we're also looking into other factors to try to figure out why it was reducing yield compared to the untreated check. Now kind of splitting all of these apart, the, this red box outlines all three of the uh, reniform resistant um, lines. And starting with College Station, the, um, all of the reniform resistant lines, they actually did not do better than the phytogen 340, which is a susceptible check. And then same thing happened at um, Damon. They did not out yield the susceptible check, but then at Wall, they actually did out yield the susceptible check. 
Now this picture, these are actually also taken by Dr. Noland. Um, I wanted to put these in here and emphasize the importance on the, the reniform resistance traits and what they actually look like in the field. Now, if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, this is actually a, um, the susceptible check, phytogen 340. And this was both of these varieties or both of these pictures were taken without um, the application of propulse. So this is just variety effect. Um, and you can definitely tell on the right-hand side of the screen that reniform resistant line is just more, more robust. I mean, it's just fuller, it's taller. Um, I don't know if you can really tell that from the picture, but it was much taller and it did out yield the um, susceptible check in, in those plots. So moving on to the, the second study, the nematicide study. So I've, like I said, I had uh, three nematicides and then I did all applicable com combinations of them. So the first one is aldicarb and that was applied in furrow using the insecticide boxes at planting at five pounds per acre. And then I had a combination of aldicarb and oximol, which oximol is a uh, common name is vitate. And then I had fluopyran protheoconazole, which is that propulse. Again, it was in furrow 13.6 ounces per acre. And then I had the combination of the propulse and the vitate. And then I had the vitate by itself. And that vitate was actually put out fully or broadcasted 30 and 45 days after planting. And that was at a rate of 17 ounces per acre. Now the very right, the far right column has prices on it. And so this actually is going to be used or this is what I referenced when um, I was doing my basic, very basic economic analysis of this study. And I do wanna point out that this is just the cost of the product. This is not the cost to put it out or anything like that. So the lint yields um, for all the locations that I could combine. So this is all site locations over two years minus the Fort Bend County 2019 location. There was a chemistry effect and I wanted to make a point of that. And so really that chemistry effect was the aldicarb and the oximol and that actually increased yield by 143 pounds. And that was compared to the known nematicide treatment. And then at Damon in 2019, which was that location that I had to analyze separately, the nematicides actually did not affect yield at all. Um, and then 2019, the use of nematicides showed no partial economic gain or loss at all locations. And that's based on yield and loan value. So, I mean, in short, last year, the nematicide study kind of took a flop on us. It wasn't as, as promising as, as we had hoped. So to really drive everything home, you know, across the locations in both years, that reniform resistant variety or lines, they were actually consistently among the highest yielding, which is very promising. Um, within some locations that reniform resistant varieties or lines, they actually yielded similar to some of the root knot resistant varieties or the susceptible check. Now this could be, um, I did not, um, present any of the nematode numbers or populations just because I don't have a full set yet. But I can tell you that in it could be because in College Station, the um, numbers were very low. And so that could have something to do with it or just the different environments, the different growing conditions and things like that across the state. Um, really in the findings of this project, they it, it's kind of indicating that genetic resistance is more likely an effective tool than nematicide applications. Now, this is a very um, uh, bold statement to make, but I feel comfortable saying that based off of last year's economic analysis and everything that we came up comparing the two projects together, it just seemed like genetic resistance was definitely more promising. And this picture down here, uh, just to harp on again a little bit more about this genetic resistance and the differences you can see in the field, this is actually a grower that Dr. Nolan works very closely with. It's, this is not my field, but at one in the area where my stuff is in San Angelo. Um, and on his or on our left, looking at the picture, that's actually phytogen 394, which is a true susceptible variety. And then on the right-hand side of the picture, that is one of the um, reniform resistant lines that I had in my study. It was the, it was, the one that was used both years, 2019 and 2020.
or no, that was the one that was used in 2020. I'm sorry. And, um, you can just tell the height difference. It's just amazing. And I thought this picture was great. And it was a great illustration of how these, how these varieties and this genetics, these genetics coming up, or, I mean, they just look so promising. Now I have a lot of people to thank that helps me out with this project. So, so mainly the Texas A&M Cotton Extension Program, Dale, especially Dale Mott, um, Haley Kennedy uh, out in San Angelo. She did a good job of checking my plots for insects and keeping the pressure down. Uh, San Angelo Agronomy Extension Program. So that's Morgan McCullough um, and then Stuart Hornsey out there. They really helped out. Dr. Isaac Heath's lab, um, his student workers helped me out quite a bit getting those uh, nematode um, samples extracted and processed. Uh, Dr. Kearns' crew for helping me harvest last, this past um, fall in College Station, and also Dr. McGinty's crew for harvesting my, or helping me harvest my stuff two years or 2019 in Fort Bend County. Um, I also would not have been able to do all of this without the awesome cooperators that we had. Um, they were just great to work with and they allowed me to do all this research in their fields and take up their time. Uh, Texas State Support Committee and the Cotton Incorporated for funding and then Bear Crop Science, Corteva, and Nutrient Ag for the donation of seed and nematicides. Now with that, I would like to thank all of y'all for your time and I'll take any questions. Great job, Jenny, great job. I'm sure there's lots of questions. Let's get to it. Hey, Jenny, um, this is Jennifer. Great hey. presentation. Hey. Um, that's awesome. I'm about to work with nematodes, so like this is very exciting for me. Oh. Um, but so, quick question on what's the difference between the reniform nematodes and the root knot nematodes and their effect on cotton? So actually, that's that is a really good question. Um, as far as like like yield effects, is that kind of what you're yeah, asking? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean that plays into your study, so that makes the most sense. Yeah. So yeah. I've actually I've I haven't actually compared the difference or like if reniform nematodes hurt the cotton more than than root knot nematodes. I do know that, and I say this loosely, but reniform nematodes are are a more like upcoming up and coming problem problem than uh, root knot nematodes. I think root knot nematodes have been more established um, as far as like being studied and things like that. Uh, but no, I wish I had an answer to tell you which one hurts the cotton more, uh, but I'm not, I'm not really sure. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Dr. Ibrahim. So Jennifer, uh, good job. Well, the, the, the root node actually is, uh, is a sedentary endoparasite, so it lives inside the root. So yep. thank and, you. That is, and the other one is semi-endoparasite, semi so it does, it does less damage. Thank I'm surprised to see that uh, that you know that you have really good resistance to reniform because it's uh, the literature says that actually there is better resistance to root knot as opposed to reniform. And in the case of reniform, you need to use nematicides. You need to combine the two, the host resistance and nematicides, which is not the case here. So how do you explain that? So well, so I have some confidence saying this because. I've counted, so there, I have counted all of the samples myself. And so I do know, and I'm only counting the reniform populations. And so I have some confidence in, in saying this, um, as far as the literature goes, saying that, you know, the, the genetic resistance plus the nematicides is the only way to go. I actually haven't read that. Uh, that's actually really interesting. I would like to get that, that information from you after this. Um, but as I, I'm not really sure how to answer that question I, besides saying I'm confident in my, in my findings and what I've seen. Um, and I mean, this is just two years worth of data. I don't know if they have more and to kind of support their findings, you know, a little bit better, but I mean, I am pretty confident in, in my findings and, and I do trust that this genetic resistance, I think it's, I think it's a very good thing. Uh, the, 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 the two, uh, there are two chemicals here, the chloropyrum and chloropyrum. Yes, sir. And the prothium, are these fungicides or, nema or nematicides? So this is actually, that's a product made by Bayer. And it's actually, it was not labeled in um, nematode use in cotton. And so they were trying to get it um, labeled in that. And one of them is a uh, fungicide. 
Yeah, these are the two of them are fungicides, actually. Yes. Yeah. So I'm. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Stelly. Uh, yeah, Jennifer, I enjoyed your talk a, a lot. I have a, a few questions. Um, first of all, do, do you have any kind of indication regarding the uniformity of infections in your fields and your data uh, from that standpoint, in terms of the nematode population levels and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So as far as, so I took pre-plant samples, and I hope I'm going to answer this correctly. I took pre-plant samples and I did count all of those um, so I knew that there were um, there were nematodes, reniform nematodes out there, but as far as like mapping the field or uniformity, they, there was not much uniformity within, you know, between the plots. It did kind of range, but we okay. did replicate it. And so. Right, right. Okay, uh, second question. Um, so you mentioned the, the root knot nematode resistance. Is there any evidence that you're aware of that there's a, any kind of a effect of root knot nematode resistance on reniform nematode resistance? As far as I know, there is none. So actually, the reason that we put all of these um, varieties, those root knot varieties in this study was because um, we had heard some talk that there were companies that were suggesting or recommending the root knot resistant varieties to growers that had reniform problems in hopes that it would work. And so we thought that we would really try it out and see if or, it actually or, may or maybe to have a sale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I think there's prob that's probably uh, the source of that. But anyway, um, so that kind of leads to uh, uh, another question. Um, and I am, am wondering when you look at the resistance, the resistant varieties that you have, do you happen to know whether or not those descend from the same resistance gene? Uh, for example, was it from the Cassipian Barbadensi 713 line? I am not sure about that. I could try to look it up and maybe get back to you, Dr. Silly, but I, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. Yeah, I, I think there's, it would be of some interest to know whether or not they have a common origin or maybe they have more than one, more than one resistance gene that they're working with, that's a yes. possibility. Um, and then the, the, the one area that I wanted to, to suggest, because I think it's something that you could take advantage of, I, I think that uh, your data looked to me, like you probably could benefit from a test where you specifically contrast susceptible versus um, resistant lines, so a groups. So in other words, while you don't have significant difference between some of your individual entries, if you were to do a contrast between your two or three susceptible, two or three susceptible lines collectively as opposed to the two or three resistant lines, mm -hmm. you may then have a significant difference. Okay, I will look into right. that. Thank you. And, and I think that would be kind of a nice thing to add to your uh, analysis of variance. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I will definitely look into that. Okay. Thanks. Dr. Zhang, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to know what, uh, what the source of the running form uh, name to resist the gene. Because I heard um, in my knowledge, there's no uh, resistance gene in cutweed coating, for example, upland, the sea island coating. There's no resistance gene for rainfall. I know there's a, a root knob, yes. No, I, I'm wondering what. Can, what can I answer that? Yes, it's please, Dr. Kelly. <laughs> so, so the resistance gene from Barbadensi, uh, and one of the sources is, is line 713, has, has actually been introduced by Al Bell. Okay, so, so it was back crossed into her pseudum, and that's why I was kind of asking whether or not that might be the source of, of these different uh, lines. There might be some others, but that one we're familiar with because, of course, Dr. Bell, as you well know, works locally here. D David, this is Terry Wheeler. If you're talking yeah. about the phytogen, I just got in five minutes ago, but the phytogen uh, lines, they went back to the Barbadense original source and extracted the cross those genes in themselves. So they didn't use Al Bell's. They went back to the original source. Yeah, but it's probably the same gene. So it's, it's it was right? the exact right. It was and they used Al Bell's markers, I think. Uh, so it was the same gene. Uh, just they went back to the original source. 
-hmm. Right, and those actually trace back, because those markers actually trace back, their homeologs are the ones that we discovered re were related to the uh, reniform resistance genes out of longicalyx. So that it's all, they're in homeologous regions to some, at least the ones on 11 and 21. Very good. I think we're out of time on this one. Good, uh, good interaction.